<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great pleasure to see you all. And uh, it's a great pleasure indeed to have uh, as our speaker today, uh, Roman Rov, uh, a social professor at the uh, University of uh, uh, Cape Town, and very well known to all of us for his wide ranging work on uh, the history, archaeology, and material culture of uh, uh, Hellenistic and Roman Italy. Uh, his uh, 2007 monograph, Styling Romanization, uh, stands out as a, as a major contribution on, on the study of, indeed, uh, the material culture of, of Hellenistic Italy in Etruria and, and beyond. Um, but he's also very well known and deservedly well known for a, for a range of, of, of important uh, contributions on, on a whole host of problems. Um, I'll single out a very recent one in AJP 2019, Sympathy with the Allies, Abusive Magistrates and uh, Political Discourse in, in Republican Rome, which I think sheds light on a number of important aspects of the uh, tensions between Rome and, and Italian allies uh, in uh, uh, the third and second centuries uh, BC. Um, the Why the problem of the... Uh, integration of uh, Roman Italy, or indeed of the integration of Italy under, under Roman hegemony is a, is a long-standing uh, interest uh, of Roman, uh, which has also fed into a, a collection that he edited with uh, Karl Hörkeskamp and Shema Karatash, uh, Empire, Hegemony, or Anarchy, Roman Italy, uh, 201, 31 BC, that uh, was published with Steiner in 2019, uh, and which is one of the outcomes of a uh, Humboldt uh, Fellowship that uh, Roman held in uh, uh, in Cologne uh, a few years a few years back. Um, his work at uh, Capena has also made uh, an important and distinctive contribution to our uh, understanding of the archaeology and material culture of ancient uh, Latium. And uh, today he's taking us to to Rome, uh, to the city of Rome. And uh, he's, uh, yes, he's going to explore, I suppose, problems of uh, integration and, well, alterity, otherness uh, in uh, mid-Republican Rome. Um, he circulated a handout, which uh, I hope you've all received. Um, and the title of his paper today is Greek Statues in Mid-Republican Rome, Pythagoras and Alcibiades Revisited. Roman, thank you very much. Over to you. Yeah, Federico, thank you very much for your kind, kind words. And uh, also, I can finally thank you properly for organizing this now the second installment of a really wonderful um, seminar series, I think, from which we all have uh, greatly, um, you and Mattia, of course, uh, both of you for, from which we all have greatly benefited. Um, this, um, this paper really emanates from a long standing sort of interest in this particular, in a particular passage, the first passage on the handout, which I held for a long time. Um, and uh, at which to look more closely, I was given the opportunity uh, when invited to a conference in um, Michigan in 2018 and a conference on Roman Hellenisms. Um, so this, this paper is um, a, um, an abridged version of a, of a chapter that um, will shortly appear in print in, a, in an edited volume um, entitled Roman Hellenisms, which will appear think with the University of Michigan Press. As you will see on your handout, there are, um, there are four sections. Now, the, the, I've, put the, I've left the fourth one on there for you, it's for your benefit, um, and we can maybe discuss it this time later, see where the argument can be taken. Um, I will not discuss it in my paper today, there won't be enough time. So I'm, I'll be focusing on, uh, on the um, passages one, two, um, and I think this um, the first passage um, will be known to um, all of you and I'll just read the English translation if that's okay. That says Pliny, Natural History 3426. I also discover that statues of both Pythagoras and Alcibiades were set up in the horns of the Comitium when during the Samnite War, Pythian Apollo ordered that images be dedicated in a prominent place to the bravest and the wisest of the Greeks. These stood until Sulla, as dictator, built the, built the Senate house there. It is extraordinary that those senators 
should have given preference to Pythagoras over Socrates, whom the same God preferred in respect of wisdom to all men, or have chosen Alcibiades in respect of valor from so many others, or indeed preferred anyone to Themistocles in respect of both categories. So the argument which um, I'm going to present here falls into two parts. Um, first, I will seek to, dem to dem demonstrate the cogency of the Senate's choice that so irked Pliny within the context of the late fourth century BC, and specifically in relation to the political configurations both at Rome and within the particular regions of, of Mediterranean in which the city was emerging as an important player. Second, I shall expand my argument by placing the sculptural group of Alcibiades and Pythagoras within the context of other public sculptures that were erected at Rome <clears throat> until about the 270s BC, and which have in common that their subjects, the subject matter and the occasions for the erection both pertained to Rome's relations with the Greek world. My main aim in this paper is to draw attention to the fact that rather than as a continuous process, Roman interest in Greek culture should be understood in terms of a complex periodization. Scholars who work on the emergence of Roman literature or who, who adopt literary models to other cultural spheres have tended to look for definitive moments at which Greek and specifically Athenian examples were deliberately absorbed into Roman culture. And I here point you to um, the items by um, Dennis Feeney uh, and Emanuele Corti on the handout. Yet the very fact that the selection of Alcibiades and Pythagoras for representation in the forum provided a source of considerable confusion to later Romans clearly points in another direction. By the late Republic and early empire, Roman conceptions of Greek culture and why it mattered to Rome <clears throat> had greatly changed from what they had been in the late fourth and early third centuries BC. One result of this was that the role of historical figures had shifted. As I will presently argue, the general trend of this shift was away from those Greeks with historical significance in the context of fourth and third century Italy and towards an Athenian dominated cast of characters that dominated the literary reception of Greek culture during the late Republic and which remains canonical to this day. It is precisely for this reason that modern readers of Pliny are usually sympathetic to his bewilderment at the mid-Republican Senate's choice. Now to the sculptures themselves. The group of Pythagoras and Alcibiades is also mentioned by Plutarch, reference on the handout, and has received considerable attention among historians of the Roman Republic since Tonio Hulcher established their status as two of the earliest examples of historical Repräsentationskunst in Republican Rome more than 40 years ago. As a consequence, any explanation for the Roman Senate's decision to have those two specific individuals represented at the core of the city's public, and thus political spaces, must take into account the place which the emerging Roman Republican state was claiming for itself within the competitive environment of central Italy and its neighboring regions. Since the erection of the Rostra in 338 BC, the Comitium had become the center of the Republic's representation of itself in relation to other Italian states. The erection of commemorative sculpture increasingly turned this prime location of political performance into an important lieu de mémoire in the city and thus into a focal point of Roman Republican cultural identity. Therefore, the Senate's choice of the subjects honored by public commemoration in the Comitium merits careful historical scrutiny. Yet in the case of Alcibiades and Pythagoras, this immediately presents us with a particular challenge of explaining a representational choice that was already far beyond Pliny's comprehension. Yet in this instance, <clears throat> Pliny's frank expression of incomprehension perhaps serves 
as an indication, the episode is in fact historical. Varro, his most likely source, would have seen the sculptures as a young man before they were demolished to make way for Sulla's new courier. His antiquarian research about the origin of the story furthermore deserves credence, even though it is most likely that Varro himself did not fully understand its historical background. The information he obtained through his researches and which Pliny almost certainly adopted, probably include the seemingly vague chronological statement, Bello Samniti, as well as the fact that the Delphic Oracle was consulted. There is no reason why the fourth century Roman Senate should have been aware of or concerned with the Oracle's earlier pronouncement in respect of Socrates, especially since Socrates may simply not have enjoyed the same status which he held among Romans of the Red Republic and early empire. For Pliny, for Pliny to assume this again, this again underlines his lack of comprehension of a historical context that preceded his own time almost 400 years. As for the chronology, a good guess may be the aftermath of the Cordine Forks um, when Rome found herself in a veritable crisis, which may have necessitated to consult an especially authoritative source of divine advice and which gave rise to, to the analytic invention that the Tarentines had deigned to put themselves forward as mediators between Romans and Samnites. Therefore, uh, another possibility would be um, the aftermath of the Battle of Lauterlei. Um, but in, at any rate, the erection of the statues um, can probably be uh, dated um, to the period of the three teens um, BC. <clears throat> The most recent approaches, um, so most of the recent approaches to the Plinian passage have drawn attention to the figure of Pythagoras. This forms the starting point of my discussion here. Pythagoras' teachings, <clears throat> or rather, that's important, their fourth century perceptions, enjoyed immense popularity among the aristocracies of Greek dominated South Italy during the fourth and early third centuries BC. However, this Pythagoras was very much a construct of the fourth century BC and propagated by the Greek elites of South Italy, where the Greek philosopher was said to have spent the final decades of his life, between about 430 and 500 BC. Arguably, the very concept of Magna Graecia as a region, um, defined primarily against Syracuse and the Italic populations, was a product of this Pythagor uh, Pythagoreanism. With a successful Tarentine politician, and philosopher Akaitis as his most prominent proponent and in some sense a founder. Akaitis' followers in fact assigned him not only greater importance than to Plato, but even claimed that he had been the Athenian's teacher following the death of Socrates. This, this makes it possible to comprehend how this cultural climate could have given rise to the notion that Pythagoras, as the inspiration, if not the teacher of Akaitis and his followers, had in fact been the wisest of the Greeks. Therefore, the Senate's choice to interpret the Delphic Oracle in the way it did makes sense if one sees it as closely connected to the historical context of Magna Graecia and as it were, as a move by the Roman elite actively to associate itself with its Greek peers. Similar trends are evident among the elites of other parts of central and south Italy. Thus, Etruscan tomb paintings sometimes feature references to Pythagoreanism and Orphism. And there was, an, there was even a tradition according to which Pythagoras had counted several Etruscans among his disciples. In south central Italy, the Samnite Herennius Pontius was a pupil of Archytas and stands out as the historically most prominent example of an Italian aristocrat outside Rome who actively immersed himself um, in Pythagoreanism, Pythagoreanism while at the same time adapting it to the Italian context. Um, I pointed there to the paper by Hawkey on the handout. Therefore, the Roman Senate step was not in itself, in itself unusual, although in this case it is also possible to identify strategic and political aspects which are not evident in other parts of Italy, simply because of the sources. For Rome was increasingly interested in fostering friendships and alliances with the Greeks of the South. 
which was of special concern during the wars with the Samnites, who could, who could be portrayed as common enemies of both the Republic and many South Italian cities. In addition, Michel Ohm has made a strong case for the socio-political importance which the new Pythagoreanism held in store for the Roman elite, and for which the, the Tarentan Archytas may have provided important inspiration as a model for overcoming the structural divisions in the Republic, and thus for cementing its own claim to leadership. As part of his, his argument, um, Holm furthermore makes, makes a largely convincing case for placing the construction of Numa as a disciple of Pythagoras and unifier of the Roman people within the cultural milieu that was influenced by Archytas and his followers. This pseudo-historical association had of course been de debunked by the late Republic. Yet this does not detract from the likelihood that the tradition had originally been created with a socio-political, for lack of a better term, purpose by members of the Roman elite. Far from being purely intellectual indulgence, therefore, this approach to Hellenism represented a far more substantive aspect of Rome, Roman elite discourse and even political strategy during the late fourth and the early third centuries BC. Even if mere remnants of this were still left in memory of the second and first centuries. <clears throat> Finally, this um, strategic ideological aspect of Rome's um, sort of uh, approach to Hellenism at, at this period may also be at the root of the Senate's choice to honor Alcibiades as the bravest of the Greeks. As in the case of Pythagoras, Pliny's expression of disbelief is fully understandable given its historical date. And it is again quite possible that Varro was able to gather the antiquarian information, however, without understanding the context in which the Senate had come to this to its decision, which must have been truly alien to any Roman in the late Republic and early Empire. Uh, Alcibiades, of course, was not a, would not have been a very sort of a prominent um, or um, liked uh, personality. Despite being a power on the rise during the late fourth century BC, Rome was still but one of several regional powers that were attempting to expand the areas of hegemony. Other ambitious powers in the mainland include Tarentum, um, favorably disposed towards Syracuse, as well as arguably some of the Samnite polities. Um, Sy Syracuse, of course, uh, herself was still a major force to be reckoned with and continued to do so until the death of Ag Agathocles in 289 BC. In this context, Alcibiades became a historical point of reference, both for Syracuse's competitors and for those smaller states that were the target of her hegemonic ambitions. Chief among them were the Greek polis of the Ionian seaboard. Though it is also important that Rome suffered from Syracusan attacks on her territory, as did the Etruscan cities further north, of course, important here the rage on per Pergi, but also the, um, the, the, raid, the raid on Latium in 349 BC. Um, <clears throat> To defend herself against these attacks, Rome largely dependent, dependent on the naval power of her Greek allies, at least until the coast of Latium, began to be sh uh, shored up by colonies during the 310s BC, of which the island settlement of Pontii, 313, probably stood out as the most important milestone in Rome's coastal defense and growing naval ambitions. But even then, Rome's alliance as a junior partner with Carthage the main opponent of Syracuse in the Western Mediterranean continued to be important in checking the Sicilian city's expansion. As the last power seriously to have challenged Syracuse's supremacy, therefore, Athens and especially Alcibiades, as a proponent of a Sicilian expedition, held positive connotations for those who were opposed to Syracuse. It is significant, but too often overlooked in this context, that little noted testimonial about the contemporary Sicilian historian Timaeus of Tarumenium 
attests to the fact that his writings were encomiastic about Alcibiades. Uh, let's see, fragment uh, Griechische Historica 566, uh, fragment 99. Um, although himself a Sicilian, um, as we all know, Tameos was hostile to the Syracusan tyrants, and to Agathocles in particular, who had sent him to exile, at least some of which he spent in Athens. And thus, by electing to display Asbiades as the bravest of the Greeks, the Roman, the Roman Senate made a statement um, that was most meaningful in the current configuration of regional power politics in relation to this. In relation to this, choosing Themistocles would have been utterly irrelevant. Just as Socrates was in the climate of political thought, which I discussed earlier, the point was not to emphasize Rome's affiliation to Athens, as Feeney and Courtier have argued, um, and others too, but to honor the memory of an individual who had been an enemy of Syracuse. If the statue was in fact set up after the battle of the Cordine Force or Lautuli, this statement should in the first instance be understood as one of strategic alignment and partnership with Syracuse's other enemies. And it is even possible that a sculptural group of Asibides and Pythagoras that existed in the South Italian polis fit model for the Roman statues. And that is um, proposed by Zehmeyer on the handout. It, it was only a generation later that sculptural representations of Rome's relations with the Greek world became claims to regional leadership. And it is these developments which I discuss in the remainder of this um, paper. Which takes us to um, the next uh, two uh, sections of the handout. So it's first section two, um, and then finally section uh, three, which is the last um, Pliny passage I only discuss. Again, I've given you um, some uh, other references here, which I will mention in passing, um, but which, which I decided not to put onto the handout or not to overcrowd it. Um, so now to three other examples of honorific uh, sculptures that still stood in the forum at the time at which Pliny's sources saw them. And these are the statues of um, Hermodorus um, and um, the uh, the Turian honors for um, two Roman politicians in the forum. If one assumes that Pliny followed Varro's description again, for much, if not, if not all of this section, this is a whole section on early representations of foreigners in the forum. Um, this might have been at the very end of the second or the beginning of the first. Uh, first century BC, I have Varro seeing this. And it is again possible that these statues were removed at the time of Sulla. Maybe Federica has an idea about this um, for the construction of the uh, Senate house. These are the statues Hermodorus, the interpreters of the 12 tables um, and of the, two, of the Roman tribune um, Gaius Aelius and the consul Fabricius. While the first sculpture represents a Greek subject, the other two were set up by the South Italian Greek city of Turi in honor of Romans who had acted in the Turians' defense against Lucanians on two occasions during the 280s BC. My argument is here, here is that the statue of Hermodorus fits in neatly to the pattern which I discussed in the previous section, namely with a conscious effort on the Roman Senate's part to the end of aligning the city with the polis of the south, which was especially topical at the time of the Samnite Wars. In the cases of Aelius and Fabricius, um, however, I suggest that it is possible to identify a distinct change in how Romano-Greek relations were represented in the forum. This was to the effect that Rome now claimed seniority in this respect, specifically placing herself as the champion of the Italian Greeks against the Oscan speaking populations of the South. Although Pliny's text does not offer any information about the date at which a statue was set up in honor of Hermodorus, 
The period between the late fourth and the beginning of the third century offers a plausible solution. Pliny follows a tradition according to which Hermodorus had in some way or other assisted the Romans in setting up the 12 tables in the mid fifth century BC. This offers an alternative to the later canonical version given in Livy's account. According to Livy, 31.8, three Roman ambassadors were sent to Athens, quote, where they were ordered to write down the famous laws of Solon and to acquaint themselves with the institutions, customs, and laws of other Greek states, unquote. By contrast, Hermodorus was said by others to have been an Ephesian whom, according to Cicero, um, passage and handout, his fellow citizens had sent into exile, which he spent in Italy. It was from there that the Decemvirs had summoned him to assist them with setting up 12 table, the 12 tables. Uh, it is probable, probable that the passage in the um, digest, um, when it refers to Italy, um, where um, Hermodorus went to in exile, almost certainly refers to a, to, a city, to a city in the Greek south of Italy. As in the case of Pythagoras and to some extent Alcibiades, the task is here to assess the possible origins of each tradition and to establish a plausible historical context in which it arose. Both the version preserved by Livy and the story of Hermodorus attest to the fact that at some point during the Middle Republic, a Greek connection was introduced into the tradition of the Twelve Tables. To Romans of the late Republic and early empire, a Solonic origin would have been both plausible and attractive, just as we saw in the case of Socrates, whom Pliny thought preferable to Pythagoras. Yet the figure of the Ephesian exile in South Italy made eminent sense during the fourth and early third centuries, when people with such biographies not only existed in, as real people, but furthermore served as a link to the Greek cities on what was then Rome's cultural and political horizon. That wasn't Athens. To emphasize this connection did not merely serve as an expression of cultural affinity. Rather, it came as a consideration of realpolitik in a situation in which the Romans were in need of Greek allies against Tarentines and Syracusans, but most importantly, in the face of Samnite aggression. As, as a barbarian city by origin, the Romans had to go to such length in order to make themselves clubbable, even if this did not always meet with success, as shown by the case of Lucius uh, Postumius Megellus at Tarentum in 282 BC, when he was mocked and insulted on account of his faulty Greek. By then, um, the um, Bellum Tarentino, however, Rome had already begun to lay claim to a position of hegemony in the south, setting herself up as a champion of those of those Greek cities which were under threat from Lucanian and Tarentine attacks. In this context, the erection of two statues in honor of Roman individuals in the forum by a Greek city acquires a significant dimension. By honoring Aelius and Fabricius in this way, the Turians accepted the patronage of individual Romans and the protection of Roman arms, which moreover signaled their approval of Roman Hellenism um, in a sense of sort of the connections which Rome established for itself to, uh, to the Greek world. Um, and as a, you know, a self-conscious insertion into the cultural and political networks of the Greek speaking South on the Romans part. While the Romans had initially expressed this, Hel this Hellenism by setting up honorific statues of Greeks at the core of their city's public life, the Turians' action served not only as a powerful acknowledgement of Rome's hegemony, which they preferred to domination by its Greek neighbor, Tarentum. It also turned the early Hellenism on its head by making Rome a central point of reference for the Italian Greeks who moreover chose to, to view Roman individuals as worthy of being honored by Greeks and in a traditionally Greek fashion, yet at the center of their own city. In contrast to the Greek individuals that had been honored, honored thus far, both Aelius and Fabricius were contemporary Romans. The erections of their statues 
then to historical dimension to the acts that undertaken in favor of the South Italian Greeks, and thus to Rome's resultant claim to hegemony over them. The historical significance of this goes beyond Rome's relations with the city of Turi. On the contrary, the sim symbolic importance of the Turian sponsored statues is echoed by other evidence which suggests that the Romans were concerned to present themselves to the Greeks as a benevolent and trustworthy hegemon and as a power that played by the rules of Greek interstate relations. The beginning of Rome's self-fashioning as a champion against piracy, for example, falls in this period too, as is shown by a famous passage in Strabo 535 that relates to how Demetrius Poliochetes asked the Romans to curb the pirates of Antium. Only a little later, the invasion of Pyrrhus caused the first conflict between Rome and an extra Italian Greek power, which marked the city's immersion in the wide Hellenistic world. Um, furthermore, it cannot be a, co a coincidence that the origin of the origins of the personified virtue of Fides go back to the same period during which it began to be honored by the temple on the Capitol. Although related to the Greek idea of pistis, the extent to which the Romans stressed the importance of Fides as a guiding principle both among themselves and their relations to other powers was unparalleled. As much as honoring Aelius and Fabricius, their statues at the same time represented a celebration of Fides as the guiding principle of Rome's relations with the Greek world, but also as an entirely positive quality. Um, which it really wasn't objectively speaking. Less than two decades later, in 266 BC, the perhaps most emphatic instance of this Roman self-fashioning occurred when Quintus Fabius and uh, Gnaeus Apronius were surrendered to the city of Apollonia in acknowledgement of the fact that they had neglected their obligation to Fides by striking the Apollonian ambassadors. Um, thus, Rome ostentatiously committed herself to be a most trustworthy partner to Greek cities and is willing to abide by Greek practices of diplomacy. Rome effectively admitted that her own position could be wrong. Notably, Apollonia was in a part of a, was in a part of the Greek of the Greek world that had historically been dominated by Syracuse, whose hegemony had, had notoriously been ruthless and reliant on raiding and piracy, and which increasingly became an object of Macedonian interests too. That whole area. As in her relations with Turi, in respect of which she had emphatically represented herself as the preferable hegemon in place of Tarentum, Rome was making a similar point here. It should be added that the Greek South Italy had of course been within Rome's reach, albeit not fully under her control, even during the 280s BC, while she could not in any way credibly lay claim to sovereignty of the Eastern Adriatic um, and thus Apollonia in 266 BC, and this is sort of where the passage four would come in, because we can sort of see the end point of this, um, of, uh, of these new um, relations with the um, Adriatic, but I shall, I shall pass over that. And I have dropped some very brief um, conclusions um, now. So to conclude from the late fourth until the middle of the third centuries BC, Rome's self-positioning vis-a-vis Greek culture through the display of commemorative sculpture had been overtly friendly to the extent that during the earlier part of this phase of Roman Hellenism, the community of Romans made a considerable effort symbolically to insert itself into the political and cultural ambience of Magna Graecia. As I pointed out above, um, the placing of the statues of Alcibiades and Pythagoras in the Comitium in the late fourth century BC is best understood as an overture to those cities in Magna Graecia which shared with the Romans the enmity with the Samnite, Samnites in opposition to Syracusan and Tarentine expan expansion. Similarly, the commemoration of Hermodorus did not in any way make an, at the time, unrealistic claim about Roman hegemony over the South Italian Greeks. Quite the opposite may have been the case, for through the placing of these three, three sculptures at the core of Rome's public life, which notably 
constituted the focal point of concord between plebs and senatorial aristocracy, the Senate emphatically subscribed the community of Romans to the very framework of values and historical references that were contemporaneously on vogue in Magna Graecia. As discussed above, this is further confirmed by other evidence, most notably the construction of the Roman King Numa as a close associate of Pythagoras. Although the principal focus of this paper was on these early Roman attitudes um, and the establishment of relations with the Greek world, it has also become clear that this needs to be contextualized, not just in relation to Sicily and Magna Graecia, either the Greek parts uh, of, this, of, this, of this region, but also to other parts of central Italy. Thus, the Etruscan and Oscan speaking elites intensively engage with Greek culture. And while the sources for these other central Italian Hellenisms are incomparably poorer than they are for their Roman counterpart, future research on the latter would have to take them into account. The fourth and third centuries in central Italy constitute a period of state formation and it appears that, as at Rome, specific perceptions of Greek culture formed an important part in these processes, of these processes. As the case of the Samnite philosopher, Herennius Pontius reveals, these interpretations could provide not only alternative models of Hellenism, but also play a role in shaping the rivalries among central Italian states. The commonly used term koine, coined by Santo Mazzarino, in the 1940s BC, no longer does justice, justice to this complex set of dynamics, I think, um, uh, which is not, uh, thoroughly um, in need of novel investigation. During a second phase of the early Roman Hellenism under discussion, Rome's self-representation vis-a-vis the South Italian Greeks became not only more self-assured, rather, the internalization of pistis transformation to fides, and in particular, the claim which the populus Romanus led to its personified virtue as one of its principal deities, all reflect a sense in which the Romans now began to view their own community as a dominant point of reference within the Greek-dominated framework of the central and western Mediterranean. The people who were commem now commemorated in the forum were no longer historical, historical Greek personages, but contemporary Roman aristocrats who were honored not by the Senate, but by a Greek community that had been a beneficiary of Rome's execution of the precepts of Fides. Thus, Roman subjects and virtues had by now acquired a kind of symbolic capital, which meant that the Senate no longer had to resort to define the Roman uh, populace's values with reference to external figures. As the Tarentines poking fun at posthumous 40 Greek shows, this process were by no means unopposed. Yet by the time of the honors for Aelius Fabricius, the Romans had become a sufficiently creditable part of the Western Greek world as to provide at least some cities of the South with an alternative to the traditional hegem hegemons of the region and what is more, to be publicly honored by these cities through the erection of public monuments in the city of Rome. I'm going to end here so for some time for discussion. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Roman. It's a wonderfully thought-provoking piece. Uh, the, the statues have made a number of appearances over the last few weeks in some of our discussions, and so it was, it was very good for them to get a, a proper airing today. And uh, yes, I'm sure there'll be questions and comments, uh, so perhaps, um, as usually, be more practical if people just register their interest in... Uh, um, oh. Uh, Uwe, Walter, would you like to perhaps expand on these, uh, hmm. this brilliant set of uh, written comments? No, but I, what I have to say is, uh, is written in the chat. Uh, okay. It's an idea which doesn't touch Roman's argument very much, but I think uh, uh, it might be, might, be, might be a reasonable thought about this. Since, since yeah. the Senate yeah. indeed wasn't so powerful leading Roman politics uh, in all aspects around 300. And I, 
I would I would pose yeah. a much yeah. much greater weight uh, to to singular aristocratic initiatives. Um, in the course of the of the erecting of those statues, but this is only only a by thought. Yeah. Well, the, mm. I suppose that will make a, a lot of a lot of sense. The earlier the, these are, so if we think about something like three fifteen with all the uh, three fifteen with all the turbulence at Rome, I think I think your idea is very attractive. Actually, uh, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you very much. I'll, I'll make a note of that. Yeah. I will, yeah, I will actually um, will I will take that into account. Thank you very much. Other um, other questions, comments? Yes, I mean on the on the on, on the involvement of the padres in that case, I suppose a, a scenario. One could also posit a scenario in which, um, well, advice is received. Um, by the by the Respublica, by the polity, from from the from the oracle, and uh, the issue is debated as a matter of jus divinum, as it were, um, by the Senate, and and it is for the Senate as a as a as a body to reach mm -hmm. to reach a decision, and and we can then assume that you know some senators who perhaps were also members of a of a priestly of a priestly college, or two even. Uh, might have, you know, made aired their views, and those views might have perhaps carried greater weight. Uh, we don't know, but in principle, whilst whilst of course the, the the point on the on the on the relative weight of the Senate in this in this period is is uh, unassailable, perhaps in this particular matter, an, an official intervention of the Senate as a, as a body is not uh, is not inconceivable. But yeah, um, can I actually ask a a, a, a question on uh, on the um, on what happens with Sulla. Um, do we really need to envisage a scenario in which the statues are destroyed? Or could we mm. think of a scenario in which the statues are moved um, somewhere else? And well, Pliny or indeed his source um, do not tell us where. Um, two, two possible, but first of all, I suppose Pliny does not explicitly say that they are destroyed, does he? But quite apart from that, um, one could invoke the anti-Samnite uh, aura of those statues as something that might have at least superficially appealed to Sulla. And uh, um, secondly, there is the uh, Delphic uh, strand of the story. Um, Sulla, of course, has a complex relationship with Delphi, but especially towards the end of the Mithridatic War, he makes a point of complying with the advice that he gets from, from, from the sanctuary, from the oracle. Um, he, he, he returns at least a large chunk of whatever he has seized from the uh, treasury of the sanctuary. Um, so he seems to be coming up with, a, with, a, with an image of, of himself that, uh, you know, speaks of pietas and, and uh, respect more generally towards, uh, towards Delphi. I wonder whether you have any... Mm -hmm. uh, Views on, on on that. Yeah, that's I think that's that's very interesting. I I, um, I suppose that does that does make quite a big, big difference because I sort of would then you know enter into the discussion about uh, how you know, how e you know, how 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 willing these sort of you know Romans you know just destroyed you know were prepared to to destroy it, uh, sculptures. I mean, of course, if they which of course very very interesting. The current context, in particular. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> um, sort of, a course that started at my university here. Mm, so I think that's quite a lot, actually. I'm, I haven't I haven't really thought about the this, um, but especially specifically about this in this context. I, I was actually was thinking about this, um, and of course, we do know about the removal of the statues in one five eight BC, but that's a very different. Um, scenario um, because those are sort of private individuals, but are honoured for things that were private rather than public. So I think it's it's an interesting question. Um, if if they were if they were moved rather than destroyed, it's possible. Um, 
maybe they still existed at Pliny's time and he himself simply didn't know where they were. Um, or, or alternatively, he saw them, but, but by that, at that time, so there, there, was, this, there was this narrative, um, but um, nothing else was, was, known, was known about them. But, you know, I mean, in terms of the, the Samnite thing, I guess it would, it would, it would make a lot of sense in, 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 that, in that context. I mean, um, I don't think that Alcibiades and Pythagoras would have been sort of recognized um, as um, particularly relevant. I think the, the, relevant, the relevance was already, already a problem, I think, in that, in that period. Um, I think Cicero makes very clear that the uh, that kind of the whole Pythagoras thing is sort of um, fake, I suppose. Um, but I, I think that just the sort of the emphasis on the Samnite wars as a, as a date, I think it does um, is 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 worthy of of, of consideration. Mm. Of course, the, the very decision not to accommodate those statues in the new in the new yeah. period is, is significant. So even yeah. even if it, it's been a removal, I mean that in itself is extremely significant, and of course it's significant uh, enough Pliny to mm. report and comment on. Um, but sorry, um, so we have uh, um, two interventions in the in in the chat. Um, but um, yeah, questions and comments more generally. Guy, Bradley, yes. I don't know whether Roman wants to respond to the chat points first, but uh... um, yeah, I'm just looking at them now. Actually, sorry, I was just uh, I'm I'm used to um to we use Teams all the time at the university, so um, Zoom is just this this weekly meeting. I um oh yeah, it's good. Okay, I've got there are quite a few there. Yeah, so that's the Amy's um point. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's okay. That's a very really useful comment. Um, I don't know if Amy, would you do we want to discuss this further or? Um, oh no, I think it's a bit of a tangent. Yeah, type of thing yeah and it's, 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 I suppose it's. I would very much like to discuss Federica's point about uh, about the, uh, uh, the the relevance of a statue to the present rather than the past and concept. You know how how that creates a a, a concept of history. Um, I think that would be. I guess maybe we should talk about that uh, next. I, 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 I responded to Guy first and then... Okay. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering about... Um, yeah, you're presenting this picture of uh, Rome engaging with the Greek world, you know, perhaps more thoroughly than it has done before in, in the fourth and third centuries. And, you know, in general, I, I agree with what you're saying. I found it entirely convincing and very interesting. Um, uh, I'm wondering to what extent, though, we're, we're kind of naturally playing this off against an idea of Rome not being very engaged with the Greek world before. And um, I know I know you haven't talked about earlier precedents and this isn't part of your paper, so I'm dragging you away from the subject that you're talking about. But um, I'm struck, for instance, by the, the alleged consultations of the Delphic Oracle mm. early on during wars. So during the, the siege of Bay, there was... And after the siege of Bay, there's said to have been consultations of the Delphic Oracle. So that would tell oh, yeah. the idea of a Samnite war and uh, perhaps at a you know difficult time of the Samnite war to consult the Delphic Oracle. Um, and then you could push it even further back and look at, uh, you know, as uh, Filippo Coelli has suggested that, that the uh, consultation of the Delphic Oracle under Tarquinius Superbus is also a, a plausible possibility. So um, I'm, I'm just wondering partly how this fits into a broader context of earlier engagement with, um, with well, with the Greek world, but also with the wider Mediterranean, you know, with the, the treaties with Carthage already from, from probably from 509 BC, uh, and what's really changing at this point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you were going to play devil's advocate, you could say, well, what really changes is that they start to put up statues and commemorate it in physical form, as, um, you know, has already been pointed out, this is, a, this is, you know, actually quite a critical change, but, but presumably it's more than that, isn't it? And it's engagement with political ideas like Pythagoras, Pythagoreanism and etc. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, um, 
Look, I th- just to start with the last um, point, I think it's, <laughs> I did I, I think about this. Actually, I was thinking about, of course, I was thinking about um, the t- Tim Cornell's discussion, of course, um, in the beginnings of Rome, you know, about the, the very early emphasis on, uh, the, rather the emphasis of very early uh, contact with the Greek world and, you know, and, and um, the idea of this corne as, as early. Um, I think the difference is uh, that at this point, the, the contact is much less sort of sporadic, I suppose. It's much, and it's much more kind of relevant to um, the, um, to Rome as a political community, as a state in a sense, simply because, because of things like the, um, the Samnite Wars. And I do, I do, I do think um, that these, um, I think these, 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 these Syracuse raids were a big problem. I think what we what we see in the sources uh, just sort of uh, just skims the surface. Um, there seems to have been quite important. Um, so I think that it became a much more urgent um, urgent issue to do. You know, um, of become much more of a core interest to the community. Um, I, I do think um, also that uh, the, the vein time consultation, um, I think is, is perfectly plausible um, of, the, of the Oracle. I mean, I, um, I, however, with, the, with, Taquini, with Taquinius, I, I think that's too, it's too early. And also I think the, the vein time one makes a lot of sense. It's also some kind of period where we have um, this sort of awakening interest actually in, in Rome, uh, in the Greek sources. So maybe that's, uh, Maybe that's also one of the reasons why you know why there is this 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 interest or this the slowly increasing um, frequency of 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 uh, by which Greek sources mention mention Rome, um, and if you just flip this, uh, sort of you know it becomes maybe maybe of course, but both sides became more relevant to one another on a more regular basis. Um, interesting enough, so Fonten Fontenrose um, in his uh, in his uh, analysis, all the known uh, instances of Delphi, consultation of Del- Delphic Oracle, he, of course, is very skeptical of even the, this episode. Uh, but I think he's he's being hypercritical here. Um, I think it is. I think it is. It is. It is very um, very plausible. Though what I would like to, and, and that's actually where um, um, Uwe Walters and, and Amy's um, I think uh, questions became interesting. You know, points comments comments became very interesting. I'm sort of wondering really about the. Um, the logistics um, and the initiative um, behind this. So the, the story of the, of course, with the story of the bowl that sort of go, gets lost and everything, of course, very chaotic and does suggest some sort of um, semi you know, private public endeavor or something like that. And even this, I think may, you know, I think it's maybe worth thinking about this um, in more detail, how this, so this would have worked, someone had to pay for it and the risky journey and, 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 and all of that. So I think it's a quite a fascinating, um, uh, topic, yeah. I thank, my thanks so much for your um, for pressing me on this because I've been thinking, I've been thinking about that, and I, <laughs> I was expecting this question at some point. <laughs> Amy. Um. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, Roman, the way you answered Guy's question really, I, I think, helped something click into focus for me about um, you know how we talk about these very early interactions that. You know, it's a methodological question, right, of whether you're thinking about them as to do with sort of pan-Mediterranean elite interactions mm. at one end of the spectrum, and then at the other end of the spectrum, something to do with state formation. And, you know, how you make that choice about how you're going to treat each individual episode, um, which to me seems to be really much more about methodological orientation than anything that we can actually see in the sources ourselves. So I don't know. Um, if you had had any thoughts on how you make that choice, um, yeah, um, of course. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I think that um, it's 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 very it's very it's very tricky. Um, I mean, of course, it can all be both. Yeah. It can be on a spectrum, and you're sort of over yeah. time, you're changing from one to the other. But, but um, that's something that I'd really like to get more of a sort of theoretical theoretical handle on. Mm. That's it's it's something I think it's uh, you know, I mean, I 
perhaps I'm sort of a little bit too, I mean, I, 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 I tend to, I tend to think that about this sort of state formation as something that is really um, comes really visible to us sort of in the late from the late fifth century on, on onwards um, at Rome, and I think um, you know there are various 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 steps that we can observe there. You know, various institutions, um, and then of course in the um, in the fourth century, particularly thinking of the, not the conquest of they alone, but of course the way in which that is handled. Um, subsequently, in terms of the, ter the territory and so on and so forth, um, uh, I think I think um, it's really at this point that we, when well, of course the the new the the, the reforms, um, political reforms that have come to fruition, then I think it's sort of this point that we can, in the sources, see much more frequently, sort of uh, there being the sense that. The, the populace acts as a collective, so, or at least it's a kind of claim, in a sense, and and that um, it probably would have appeared to outsiders as such as well. And I think the the contrast, I think the sort of archaic mode um, of the individuals or the groups um, also dominating so the outward appearance of, of Rome. I think that would have continued for quite quite some time. And of course, it's not it's not straightforward. Um, and I think a very useful here is also Jeremy Armstrong's work on. Um, on, 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 the, on the military, that you know, there's sort of there are times in which this is very much in parallel. So they have these have this, the structures, and then the private structures. But you have the emerging public structures, and they're not they're not not always at peace. Um, so I think it's um, yeah, and I think I think that's why uh, Michel Holmes' um, argument about the this this attractiveness of 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 sort of Numa via Pythagoras as, as a unifier, as someone actually brings together the community as a sort of fourth century construct, I think is, is very attractive. Um, I, I, don't, I don't agree with his points on much of the other stuff about the um, you know, Romano companions and everything, but I think that is a sort of the idea of that, um, the symbolism I think is, um, is, worth, is worthy of consideration. Thank you. We have another comment in the chat uh, from Bunny Waring, taking us back to Sulla. Um, but ah, perhaps, we, yes. But if there are, you know, verbalized questions, uh, vo you know, vocalized questions, rather, I should say, um, by all means, let us go ahead with those. The location, yes, I have. Um, and in fact, so the paper, I, I, part of the paper I deprived you of, for a lot of the location. And you know, the, the sort of the thing of that is that, you know, then the, 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 the other, um, the ambassadors um, of the First Illyrian War come into play. I won't go into that, but anyway, the point is that these ambassadors, prob and in the vicinity of these statues, they're all, they're all discussed together by Pliny. The ambassadors were definitely on the greco -stasis. Oh, sorry, opposite. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, basically, they're there. Is you see ambassadors, and almost certainly, or very probably, very probably, also the other these other sculptures were in full view of foreign Greek ambassadors when they came to Rome. In a sense, so that setting is quite cool because you have then you have sort of examples, um, you know, examples of you know Fides, but also sort of examples of. Uh, kind of warning examples, you know, example warning you not to um, not to tempt the Romans um, by um, by you know being a breach of Fides. I think so. I think that is that is that is quite an interesting um, uh, possibility um, that they actually are in a you know. But I don't want to push that too far. But it's quite possible that they do have a diplomatic purpose, at least in retrospect. And we know that the, the ambassador group, I don't know if I put it on the handout, the Cicero passage, um, that of course, yeah, Oct Octavius. So there were, there were later additions to these ambassadors. So it appears to have been a theme. And, um, and this, there must be a, a reason why these were in the, that part of the forum where also you know, foreigners were <laughs> received and humiliated. Yes. 
But of course, the other things I want to say briefly, and uh, another fi final uh, thought to Bunny's um, point, which also goes back to Amy's paper, actually. Um, it's, of course, <laughs> it's the problem of the, of the shape. So the, the question here is the horns of the Comitium. What is this? Are these the outer, if you think about the, um, you know, the Comitium as a shape, so make sure of the shape, and at the end, uh, the, the statues, that will work, but then again, there's Carathas possibility of there being, um, you know, of the early issue having, having a triangular, which is, is not, isn't widely accepted. But, you know, that, the problem is that, and I, as I spoke to, uh, to Nicola um, uh, uh, Terranato about this a while ago, who actually is very familiar with the archaeology of this, and the archaeology is, is so compromised that it's almost impossible to sort of decide anything. Uh, so this, uh, so in a sense, I think, I think it is very possible that when Varro saw these statues, they were no longer there. They, they were still the Comitium, obviously, but they were in a different sort of setup because the setup of the that very space had been altered at least, at least, at least once, almost probably, probably twice. So that in itself is is is, is of course an issue. Yeah, and we're getting this Varro via Pliny, who has no idea what the Republican yeah. Committee looked like, and you know, you have yeah. to imagine all these uh, uh, trails of misunderstandings. No, exactly. Yeah. Ones. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. That's 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 the thing, and then of course, this whole Varro thing is 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 only an, uh, you know, it's, it's a guess, but I think it's a fairly um, you know uh, probable one. Um, I think. Um, um, also, yeah. Sorry, Roman. Um, I'm, I'm done. I'm fine. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I had a question on um, um, a quick query, really, rather than a question on uh, on Hermodorus, mm. who, unless I'm overlooking something, seems to stand out in his own way from this small dossier because he's a, for lack of a more precise term, uh, some sort of cultural mediator, isn't he, mm. between yeah. Romans and Greeks. Um, also linguistically, so. Um, do we have any comparable cases in, uh, um, in the dossier of uh, statues in the city of Rome, in Republican Rome or even later, or representations of yeah, cultural mediators, or of people that actually performed a service of a work of mediation between, between Romans and Greeks, as opposed to, say, great role models like great and problematic role models like Pythagoras and Alcibiades. Well, I, I suppose Pythagoras would to some extent have been that because I mean, the, the, the idea, well, I think the idea was that, you know, he was, you know, he had been, he had been there with Numa, they had been mates, you know. Um, so I think that's, that is one possibility. Um, but I, I sort of, I, I, I can't actually think, I'm just thinking about the other foreigners, um, that appear there, and I've, as far as I recall now, there is nothing. It's a whole section on foreigners in shown in the forum, um, and but I cannot, I cannot actually remember um, anyone else. Uh, I suppose in terms of physical people, I suppose we have then, of course, here eviction of the philosophers, um, which is a great contrast, actually, bring a Greek philosopher into your forum um, in, in, the, in the second century BC. But um, I just took my head, I can't actually think of any specific examples of another mediator. It's just, it's just interesting. I mean, I wonder if there was, maybe there, maybe there was a, a, a statue of Solon as well, as people don't know about it. Because it's, it's very, very interesting. I mean, um, it's been interesting how suddenly Solon just pops up in this, in this story. Which really doesn't make sense. This kind of joint journey to to Athens, you know. Whereas this, it, it, it makes a lot of sense um, to have to have made up or really have you know, a tradition about um, a a Greek who had to spend time in, in the Italian South and sort of doing doing this kind of job. I think that's that is that is possible. Thank you very much. And yes, the, the question really sprang from my inability to come up with any uh, yeah. terrible example. So yes. <laughs>
Um, thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes, indeed. Mattia points out that Solon does does have a yes a walk on part in the tradition on the twelve tables, to put it mildly. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just I wonder when I wonder when this when this sort of uh, there the clearly seems to be a, a conflict, but I think the conflict is actually a, a sequential one. I think there's a change at some point, and when the question of when that sort of change would have been would have been interesting. Um, would be interesting to to know because I think there is I think there is there is a change, but um, it's not as the same particularly rapid change. And that was I was struck by this by um, by Feeney's argument um, about literature that there's this moment, um, this this revolution, and I, I think that's a little bit, a little bit too sort of too rigid um, a model. <clears throat> yes. Right. Um, unless there are other questions or, or, or comments, I think um, we should thank Roman very warmly indeed uh, for, for this brilliant uh, paper and, and, uh, and well, thank to all of you, of course, for, for this uh, discussion. Um, we are reconvening next week, uh, Thursday, 4.30, usual time for our last seminar before the Easter break. Um, we'll have Michele Bellomo talking about... Uh, army, army and, and politics. politics. Army and politics. In uh, make mid me republic and Rome. Yep. There we go. Much to look forward to. And um, uh, well, thank you, thank you all very much. And again, Roman, thank very you much. Very much. Well. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.